Welcome this morning. It's good to have you, and, and uh, let's jump right into the book of Revelation this morning, chapter 3. We're going to be looking at the church at Sardis today, and just as we begin uh, this, this morning, I uh, just want you to begin to think about whether you are contributing to the life of the church, all right? I'm not talking about the, the, the programming of the church necessarily. I'm not talking about those kind of things, but the spiritual vitality of the church because we're going to look at a church this morning that is dead. I heard about a church that in the middle of the sermon, somebody had a massive heart attack and died. It was silent, so nobody did anything. Everyone was very quiet, and, uh, and one of the uh, leaders uh, went outside, called 911. The ambulance came. And the pastor just went right on preaching. And when the people from the ambulance came in, the EMTs came in, and they went through the sanctuary, and they went through five people before they found the person who had actually had a heart attack. And so I hope that uh, when you're in church, it is evident that you are, you are um, spiritually centered, uh, enthusiastic about worshiping the Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and, and you are in, in tune with the moving of the Holy Spirit. That there's a spiritual vitality. You're not just taking up space on the pew. You're not just taking up uh, uh, time during the service. But you are actually a vibrant participant in what the Holy Spirit is doing when God's people gather together. All right. Revelation chapter 3. Uh, would you stand with me as we read God's word? Revelation chapter 3. We'll begin at verse 1. We're on, again, we're on the fifth church in our Revelation church series. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says this, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then, what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will know, not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we just ask and invite your Holy Spirit to minister. As your word goes forth, Lord, I pray that you would bring life. You are the author of life. You are the author of the second birth that brings spiritual life. Jesus, you said, come, uh, those that would come to you, those that would serve you, those that would live for you, Lord, would experience life and life more abundantly. So I pray today, God, that your church would be alive in who you are and in what you are doing. So be with us today, Lord. I pray for your anointing and ask God that your word would be transformative in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The greatest thing, I think, in the world, the greatest thing in the world is a church that is alive. A church that is alive. Uh, the worst thing in the world is a, is a dead church. A church that has no life in it, that's dead. Sardis, though, listen, Sardis was a church with a reputation of life, but was really, in reality, it was dead. They were dead. In other words, you can be active, you can be growing numerically or financially or program, uh, in our programs and still be dead, spiritually dead. Don't let the fancy light shows or charismatic personalities or, or uh, creative ideas and, or novelty of approach, don't let that uh, 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 confuse the real issue. The real issue is not whether we're using the latest technology, not whether we're using the latest gimmick, but whether we are spiritually alive. Whether we're spiritually alive. Uh, see, really the 
the point is uh, for Sardis is that reputation won't get you into heaven. The reputation that Sardis had was that they were a church that was alive. That was their reputation. But God said, I know, though, really where you're at. And you're not alive. You're really, you're dead. You're dead. Even though you have the reputation. You see, here's the thing. God doesn't care so much about your reputation with the world around you or with other people. Because God knows who you really are. Whatever your reputation might be, God knows who you are at the core of your being. And uh, this was the problem that Sardis, on some level, was hypocritical. Uh, maybe it didn't start out as something intentional. Probably no one starts out saying, you know, I think I just want to be a hypocrite. But uh, they found themselves there. They, they had this reputation that they had nurtured and that they had strengthened over time in in their community, among themselves. And, uh, that, and that reputation was, wow, this people, this church, it's alive. It, they're doing good. They're wonderful. It, it's great. And God said, no, you have the reputation, but you don't have the real life. So Sardis was a church that was active. It was well known. It was growing, uh, uh, at least numerically and, 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 and ways like that. Uh, probably Sardis was a church that, like many churches today, had lots of ministries. There was exciting worship. There was a good preacher. There was uh, teachers and, and small group leaders that were doing great work and, and uh, dynamic song leader, a popular youth group, and, and uh, activities for kids. And it was all great. Kids wanted to be there. Uh, all these kinds of things. They, they probably had just like churches have today. And it, and it, and it portrayed to most people a sense of real life, but God said, you have the reputation, but there's no real life. You're still a dead church. Your reputation, whatever it might be, needs to coincide with what really is. A lot of people work on their reputation, which is an external uh, view of what people see. Uh, but they don't ever change what's real about them, the heart, the core of who they are. And this is a problem in Sardis. They weren't really alive, though they were doing things that would indicate that they were alive. Uh, I, I asked myself, why, why is it that the church in Sardis would, would die? We've looked at some of the other churches. In fact, just before this, the church in Thyatira is a, is a church that is suffering. And many of the churches in Revelation are churches that dealt with persecution of some kind. They had trials that they had to overcome. But why the death of Sardis? It doesn't say anything about them being uh, a subject to difficulties or subject to trials or persecution of some kind. They weren't facing these kinds of things. And so what is it that led them to to be spiritually dead. There were no external threats, no threats of persecution. The city of Sardis didn't really care what you believed. They didn't care what religion you were. They didn't care what God that you worshipped. And so they wouldn't persecute Christians for their claims. they just ignore and move on with whatever they were going to do. And so what was the cause of spiritual death? It didn't even seem like there were real uh, internal threats. Unlike some of the other churches, uh, 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 he didn't name anybody that was spreading false doctrine or heresy. Uh, and there's none of those kinds of things were being circulated. They didn't tolerate people like the Nicolaitans or the followers of Balaam or Jezebel or Gnosticism or, or any other kind of false teaching. They, it seems by, at least by what is addressed by the Lord to the church in Sardis, the, their problem was not... Uh, that they were heretics or had false teachers. They were orthodox. They, were, they believed right. They were biblical Christians. They, they, they knew the right answers to some of the theological questions, yet they were still dead. They were still dead. You know what that tells me? You can believe the right things and still be dead. You can believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, that He's the Savior of the world. You can believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, and you can still be spiritually dead. You can believe that Jesus will return one day, that, that He's coming back again. And, and, uh, and you can believe all those things, but you could still be spiritually dead. 
No, I think Satan changed up his attack on the church at Sardis. And rather than attacking them externally or internally in the life of the church, you know what he did? Nothing. He changed up his strategy here and he just said, I'm just going to leave the church in Sardis alone. I'm not going to bother them. I'm not going to uh, put persecution upon them. I'm not going to try to infiltrate with false doctrine. And I'm just going to leave them alone. I'm going to turn them over to their own devices and see what they, what, what they come up with. So Satan left them alone. And so they became the dead shell of the greatest thing in the world, the church of Jesus Christ. The reputation of life. And yet they were dead. They were dead. I don't know uh, why it is, but it would seem if you look in church history and even the church in the United States with all the freedoms that we have, in many ways it's like Satan's just said, I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to let you have your rights. I'm going to let you have your freedoms. I'm going to let you have all these kinds of things. You'll, you'll experience all kinds of blessings. But my desire is the same thing that happened to the church at Sardis would happen to the church today, and that is that you would have the reputation of life, but you would be dead. Sardis, they did Christianity, they did church, they did good deeds, and yet they ceased to be a living church. They were kind of like the dinosaur bones in a museum. Very impressive, large and impressive and wonderfully looking, and yet they were dead. Uh, a lack of struggle, sometimes really even a lack of persecution or difficulty can, can, attribute, can, can contribute to our own spiritual weakness. We can become weak, we can become apathetic, and then certainly apathy and, and, and uh, being at ease in Zion leads quickly to a place where we're really, we're just spiritually dead. I remember growing up, as, uh, um, in uh, certain times of the year, you could go out and you could find cicadas, and cicadas were those bugs uh, that would be under the ground. In fact, I think that they're, the larva is under the ground for so many years, and then they come up every so many years, and they would climb up on trees, and then they, they, would, they would actually get out of their exoskeleton, and they would have wings, and then they would fly away. And you'd hear them a lot of time on a summer night, or all the racket, if you're near a woods especially, and the buzzing kind of sound that they make. And, uh, but once they leave that exoskeleton, a lot of times it will be on a tree or sometimes on the side of a building or something, and uh, that exoskeleton will still be there. It's the shell. And uh, I remember... Uh, uh, as, a, as a boy uh, playing with, with my brothers and we would, we would get those, see how many we could find and we'd have an army of, of these shells, they're dead shells. Now, now I, 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 one time in particular I found one that was still in the shell. It was not, had not climbed up and, and left its exoskeleton. It was alive. And while I had handled the other ones and I wasn't afraid to carry those in my hand, uh, the one that was alive was a little bit different. I don't want to touch that one. I don't want to touch that one. I could always find the dead shells, but it was hard to find the live ones. And I just pray that as a church, we never become like the dead shell of a cicada. What God desired to do, what God desired to do through his people and the life of the, of the church of Jesus Christ to go forth with power, to take the good news of the gospel to the world, be nothing more than a reputation that we have. And in reality, no, no life spiritually whatsoever. There's a few, de a few symptoms I'll give you of, of what I think a, a dead church might be like. A dead church loves form rather than God. Or I could even say it this way. A dead church loves form more than God. They love their forms. We, we tend to fall in love with the structures of what we do rather than the Savior. We, we have this tendency to, to fall in love with how we do church or, or how, uh, what our style is or what our preferences are. We kind of fall in love with those kinds of things. And, and, uh, and sometimes it puts us in the place where we're not willing to adapt to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And what he wants to do. And when we refuse to adapt, when we refuse as God's people to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's no wonder we experience death. When we love our forms more than we love the Lord. 
That's why people sometimes uh, get upset in church uh, when babies cry. I've never understood why people would get so upset about a little baby crying in the service. All right. Now I know that any reasonable mother will eventually walk out of the sanctuary if she has a, a baby that just cannot be settled and cannot be calmed for anything. That happens from time to time. But some of us that were parents ourselves ought to think back and remember that, that there was a time when it was difficult for us to have little ones and wouldn't we have liked a little bit of grace? But even more than that, you know, really what it comes down to is that we cease to forget that the fact that there are little ones who might be crying in our sanctuary is a good sign that there's some life in the, in the sanctuary. That there's, there's little ones growing up in the life of our church and they're a part of the, our fam, the family of God in our local area. And that's a positive thing. That's a beautiful thing. I've often said to people, you get upset about baby crying in the sanctuary, well, just go back and sit in the nursery and listen to the service over the intercom or something. It really comes down to us getting upset that our forms have been changed, rocked around. Uh, I'll tell you uh, something that can really change, um, uh, get some people ruffled, is to change the order of service. Now, we have an order of service, and, and uh, we have things that we will do almost every week, and, and uh, that this is kind of a form that we follow, and, and I want you to understand that these, this order of service is something that we, you ought to be praying over, and we offer up to the Lord because we believe it will bring glory to Him. That's why we do things the way we do things sometimes. But let me uh, help you to understand that the order of service is not the law it is not the guiding principle of who we are the guiding principle is the holy spirit and so if god moves in a special way um, in our church services we want to be spirit led not form led not uh, 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 order of worship led but we want to be led by the spirit of god it reminds me of of john wesley the founder of methodism and and uh, when he was first introduced to what they call at this time at, the, at his time, field preaching. Uh, and he had, he had always believed that the only time the preaching ought to be done is in a church service. And so John Wesley, he said this about his response uh, to uh, field preaching at first. He said, I scarce believed it possible that one could be born anew in the coarseness of nature. You know what had happened? He realized I had started to fall in love with a form that God was saying, that's good, but I've got something even better. And he preached outdoors at one particular time to over 3,000 people without the technology we have today. Uh, what am I saying? I want to be alive, and life is always adapting to what's going on. It's always adapting don't fall so much in love with your forms and your preferences and your way that you think things ought to go that you're not willing to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people know what a taxidermist is. Uh, taxidermy is the, is the process like if you are a deer hunter, for example, and they would take the, the deer head and a taxidermist would stuff that uh, deer head so you can mount it on the wall to show people your trophy uh, deer or sometimes they'll do fish or they'll do birds and sometimes it's not just uh, for hunters but they'll actually do that with animals that uh, uh, that they can put those stuffed animals in in a uh, museum or uh, to do for educational reasons or whatever but uh, the thing about a taxidermist a good taxidermist can take the dead carcass of an animal and when they are done, they make that animal look, appear, that it is still alive. In fact, there's a lot of people who believe that ministry, ministry itself, is really about making the church appear alive rather than to be alive. And God's called His church to be life. And alive in Him. And we're called to be that. So let's not fall in, more in love with our forms than we do with the Savior. The second is 
uh, a church, a good sign of a church that's dead is that it's more concerned with material and physical things than spiritual things. In fact, I've, I've uh, uh, been pastoring long enough to know that there are some churches that are just absolutely consumed by finances. That's all they're worried about. See, for them, the end of the church is its own survival. They've negated the mission. They've negated the purpose. They, they could care less whether, in some ways, now they wouldn't say it this way, but really they're care, they care less whether there's anyone being born again, whether anybody's coming to know Jesus. Their concern is whether they can pay their electric bill, whether they can meet this need or that need. And, and certainly we need people who will pay attention to those kinds of things. So it's not that all those things are evil, but when they grab our attention more than the Savior, more than the things of the Spirit, and we forget what we're called to do, and we, were, we forget what the church has been commissioned to do and to be, then it's not going to be long before we experience spiritual death. We're too concerned, consumed. In fact, that's why so many churches suffer during building projects. If they're building a new church or building a new facility or doing those kinds of things, and, and they're making those kinds of decisions because what can happen is those churches can be just become consumed with the physical of their building. And they get their eyes on that. And then if their eyes are on that and they're distracted from the spiritual nourishment from, that comes from walking daily with Jesus, then what do you have? Well, you have churches that split over the color of the carpet. You have churches that, with people full of people who can't get along because uh, they focus more on the physical than they have spiritual. Um, Here's, here's another way uh, that, that kind of becomes evident. is If you'll listen to prayer request time, you'll find that many of our prayer requests, in fact, an overwhelming majority of prayer requests today are not for spiritual things but for physical things. Now, I'm not saying that we don't pray for the sick because the Bible says we're to pray for the sick. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus, Jesus prayed for it and touched those who were sick, and that, that needs to take place. But sometimes we need to remember what we're really called to to be about and so what if everybody's healed physically but no one comes to know Jesus we've not done what we're called to do and then we lose vision the Bible says where there is no people there is no vision the people perish in Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 this is not just a uh, a vision is not just about having a thing, a goal on the, on, the, on the calendar. This is what we're going to try to accomplish. But it's something that as God's people, we need to always be asking ourselves, where is God's Spirit leading us? Where is God's Spirit taking us? Where is God uh, directing us to be and to go? And this is important. These are important things. To have a vision. Uh, too many churches don't have a vision any more than just surviving week by week. Just hoping people will show up. Just hoping people are there. Dead churches have no vision. Dead churches may have activity, but they don't really know where they're going. They don't really know what they're trying to accomplish outside of their own survival. And when our, our preoccupation is with our survival, we're dead in the water. We're dead in the water. Because we have no vision. Most stuff debated in churches today doesn't even make the pages of the Word of God. Most of the things that churches and Christians fight over don't even get any press time in the New Testament. And why is that? Because there are things that just simply do not matter. I recently um, watched a, a video uh, devotion uh, from uh, Dr. Jim Deal. He was a General superintendent in the Church of the Nazarene, and always appreciate uh, and love to hear him preach. And, but he shared an illustration that he had heard one time, and said that uh, if you jump off a bridge to save a person from drowning, you're a hero. But if you jump off a bridge to save, jump off a bridge to save a hat, you're just a fool. What was he saying? He's saying make sure that what you're willing to risk your life for. Is something worth risking your life for? There was a lady that was taking a, uh, a tour at the Westminster Cathedral, and uh, she was listening as the tour guide walked them through the, the, the different places in the cathedral and all the litany of the famous people who uh, were buried there 
at the that this Westminster Cathedral and and finally after she listened for long so long she'd held her peace long enough and finally she just blurted out she said has anybody been born here lately is there any life here um, the death of a church is a slow thing sometimes um, the death of the church doesn't normally happen uh, abruptly like a church has a heart attack or a massive stroke or something or and just boom it's done it's over but a church dies slowly it's something that can sometimes be subtle it doesn't come through big sins normally it can but it doesn't always uh, it comes through little weaknesses that we've got to guard against and Roman, um, the Roman Empire during the time of Jesus, uh, there are, uh, uh, they did uh, work, uh, they, would, they would build the, the roads that, in fact, some of the Roman roads of the Roman Empire are still in existence today. In fact, some of them are even still used. But the Roman road workers, and uh, they had stone cutters, and um, uh, they didn't have, technology-wise back in that day, they didn't have jackhammers and modern tools that we have that that we could have they could cut those stones to the perfect measurements and all that kind of stuff but they were tedious about their job nonetheless and and the what they did when they had a stone that that they were wanting to shave down to put in that in that road to make like what we would refer to even maybe like cobblestone roads is that they would they would look at that rock and they would look for and be able to get an eye for the weakness where in this rock where in this stone is there a weakness that I can exploit and then they would just slowly exploit it until they got that stone the way that it wanted to be you know uh, uh, William Shakespeare uh, uh, there's a genre of writing that he did uh, that were called the tragedies and uh, the tragedies were were tragedies because there was a character that was called the tragic hero who uh, was 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 referred to as such because he had the potential to be a hero to be uh, a, a great and the hero of the story but he failed because he or she did not overcome their weakness they didn't overcome their weakness for Othello, it was jealousy. Hamlet, it was indecision. Macbeth, it was ambition, and so on and so forth. And you know, there's just too many churches that could fit the mold of being a tragic church. The people that made up that church never learned to overcome their own weaknesses. They never allowed the Spirit to guide them to the place where they confronted, this is where we're weak, this is where we struggle. By the grace of God, we will overcome. We will overcome. They never got to that place. Verse 5 says, The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot, out, blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. The one who conquers. The one who conquers. The one who fights the battle and overcomes. Uh, there's uh, uh, often if you go to a doctor's office or a, you're in a waiting rooms in certain places. Uh, sometimes in those waiting rooms they'll have real plants in soil, and potted plants. But oftentimes they it just requires so much maintenance that they don't do that. They have fake plants. And the thing about a fake plant is you don't have to water it. It doesn't need any water. You don't have to feed it. You don't have to have it in real soil because it needs no nourishment. Really, it doesn't need anything. And the thing about a good fake plant is that it looks good. It looks alive. It looks, it's plausible that it would be one that's alive if you weren't up close to it or you w looked at it from a distance. Because it needs nothing, though. It, it doesn't need anything. It's, uh, it's, it's dead. It's It's fake. No nourishment needed. But for a church that is alive, the church alive recognizes we need to be nourished by the presence of God. We need it desperately. You know, um, you know why you can know that a flower is fake is if you smell it. Fake flowers, they don't have any smell. No smell whatsoever. 
one of the ways that you can know that a church or a Christian is not alive, they're fake or they're dead, is that they no longer carry the aroma of Christ wherever they go. What about you? Are you alive? No, I'm asking really, are you spiritually alive? Or you just have the reputation of being that way? Well, I shared something on social media. I forwarded an email. I've got a bumper sticker on my back bumper of my car. I'm not asking that. I'm asking, are you living life more abundantly in the spirit of Christ? Are you alive? Would you stand with me?